Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to look at a whole topic review for acids and alkalis. Go to the link in the description box to be able to download a worksheet that you can work through as you watch this video. Let's start by looking at the pH scale. The pH scale runs from below 0 to above 14, with 7 being neutral. It is a measure of the hydrogen ions in a solution. It is a logarithmic scale where pH 1 is 10 times more acidic than pH 2 and pH 14 is 10 times more alkaline than pH 13. Water exists in an equilibrium with its ions, hydrogen and hydroxide. The double-headed arrow means that the reaction is reversible. Only a small number of water molecules split into ions. The number of hydrogen and hydroxide ions in water is equal, therefore water is neutral with a pH of 7. Acids contain more hydrogen ions than hydroxide ions. This means that their pH is then less than 7. Alkalines contain more hydroxide ions than hydrogen ions. Their pH is greater than 7. Diluting an acid with water will decrease the concentration of hydrogen ions and move the pH up closer to 7. Diluting alkalis will decrease the concentration of hydroxide ions and move the pH down closer to 7. Soluble metal oxides will form alkalis. When they dissolve in water, hydroxides form. Soluble non-metal oxides will form acids. Pause the video now and try these questions. An alkaline solution contains less hydrogen ions than an acid. Adding water to an acidic solution will raise the pH. Sodium oxide is a soluble metal oxide. This means an alkali will form when it is dissolved in water, increasing the pH. Carbon monoxide will have no effect on the pH of water as it is not soluble. Sulfur dioxide will decrease the pH of water as it is a soluble non-metal oxide. Iron 2 oxide will have no effect on the pH of water as it is insoluble. Silicon dioxide will also have no effect as it is insoluble. Substances which neutralise acids are called bases. Bases which dissolve in water are called alkalis. Examples of bases are metal oxides, metal hydroxides, soluble metal carbonates and insoluble metal carbonates. When bases react with acids, water and a salt are produced. The name of the salt is based on the name of the acid. The end of the salt name changes depending on which acid you have. Hydrochloric acid will form chloride salts. Sulfuric acid will form sulfate salts. Nitric acid forms nitrate salts. Phosphoric acid forms phosphate salts. And ethanoic acid forms ethanoate salts. The salt names for the last four can be found on page 8 of your databook. Generic word equations can be written for reactions of each of the different types of base. Acid plus metal oxide will give salt and water. Acid plus metal hydroxide will also give salt and water. Acid plus metal carbonate will give salt plus carbon dioxide and water. Pause the video now and try these examples. Sodium hydroxide and nitric acid will form sodium nitrate and water. Magnesium oxide and sulfuric acid will form magnesium sulfate and water. Copper carbonate and hydrochloric acid will form copper chloride, water and carbon dioxide. Lithium hydroxide and phosphoric acid will form lithium phosphate and water. Calcium carbonate and nitric acid will form calcium nitrate, water and carbon dioxide. In solution, acids, alkalis and salts split into ions. Ions which do not get involved in the reaction and are present at the start and the end unchanged are called spectator ions. Reactions which eliminate spectator ions and show only the reaction, reacting ions can be written for the reactions of metal oxides, metal hydroxides and the carbonates. For metal oxides, only the hydrogen ions and the oxide ions are involved to form water. With metal hydroxides, only the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions react to form water. The rest are spectator ions. With soluble metal carbonates, the hydrogen ions and the carbonate ions react to form water and carbon dioxide. The same is the case for the insoluble carbonates. 
The only difference is the carbonate has a solid for its state symbol. In each of these equations, the relevant spectator ions have been eliminated. Spectator ions are also present when a precipitate is formed. A precipitate is a solid which is produced from reaction of two solutions. Spectator ions can also be identified in these reactions. Here we have a reaction between potassium iodide solution, lead nitrate solution, to form potassium nitrate solution and lead iodide solid. You can use your databook, page 8, to find out what the solid would be during a precipitate reaction. You swap over the negative ions to find what the new names will be of your solutions and your solids. You can look these up on the table and then find which one will be solid. Here we're writing out a balanced equation. We have potassium iodide plus lead nitrate to give potassium nitrate and lead iodide. This balanced equation can then be written out using ionic formula. If you need a reminder on how to do this, there will be a link in the description box below. Once you have the ionic equation, you can go through and cancel out any ions which are identical on either side of the equation. In this case, the potassium ions and the nitrate ions do not change. This leaves the iodide and lead ions. These are the reacting ions, so we can eliminate the spectator ions and rewrite the equation, showing only those ions which react. Pause the video now and try these examples. In this first example, the chloride ions and the sodium ions are spectator ions and therefore can be eliminated. This is because they do not change on either side of the arrow. This means that the reaction without the spectator ions is a hydrogen ion reacting with a hydroxide ion to give water. In the second example, the spectator ions are the sulphate ions as they do not change on either side of the arrow. In the final example, the chloride ions and the aluminium ions are the spectator ions and can be eliminated. This leaves the barium ions and the sulphate ions as the reacting ions. Titration reactions involve reacting accurate volumes of solution with each other. Often an indicator is added to see the end point. This allows you to calculate either the concentration of an unknown reactant or the volume of a reactant. The first step for a titration is to rinse and fill the burette with one of the solutions. Step 2 is to rinse and fill the pipette with the other solution, then transfer this to a conical flask and add some indicator. Read and note the start value of the burette, then place the conical flask on a white tile and add 1cm cubed at a time from the burette with swirling. Stop adding from the burette when the colour change occurs. Read and note the end value of the burette, then calculate the titer. Or the added volume. Rinse the conical flask and add another aliquot of solution using the pipette and add indicator. Read and note the new start value of the burette. Refill if necessary. Then calculate the previous added volume minus one. Add this volume quickly to the conical flask with swirling. No colour change should occur within this time. Add dropwise with swirling until the colour change and then note the final volume. Calculate the titer. Repeat these steps until you achieve concordant titers. These are titers within 0.2 millilitres of each other. For example, 19.9 and 20.1. Titration calculations can be used to calculate concentrations or volumes of solution. In this example, we are calculating the concentration of the sulfuric acid. Step 1 is to calculate the average titer of sulfuric acid using the concordant titers 10.8 and 10.6. Add these together and divide by 2 to get the average, and then divide by 1000 so that your average titer is in litres. We need to calculate the moles of the sodium hydroxide. We have two pieces of information about sodium hydroxide, concentration and volume. It is important that you convert the volume to litres first by dividing by 1000. We then multiply the concentration and the volume together to get the moles of sodium hydroxide which was in the pipette. In this case, this is 0 0.02 moles. Using the mole ratio from the balanced equation, we can work out the number of moles of sulfuric acid that was in the average titer. 
two moles of sodium hydroxide will react with one mole of sulfuric acid. This means we need to divide the number of moles of so sodium hydroxide by two to find the moles of sulfuric acid that we used. We didn't have two moles, we have 0 0.02, so dividing by two gives 0 0.01 moles of sulfuric acid. We now have two pieces of information of, about sulfuric acid, the number of moles and the volume from the average titer. By dividing the moles by the average titer, we'll get the number, the concentration of sulfuric acid as 0 0.93 moles per litre. Pause the video now and try this example. In this example, we are calculating the concentration of phosphoric acid in the burette. The first step is to find the average titer using the concordant titers 17.8 and 17.6. These give an average titer of 0 0.0177 litres. Now using the two pieces of information about lithium hydroxide, we can calculate the number of moles of lithium hydroxide that we used. Remember to convert the volume by dividing by 1000. We multiply the concentration by volume to get a number of moles of lithium hydroxide of 0 0.025. Using the molar ratio from the balanced equation, we can see that 3 moles of lithium hydroxide will react with 1 mole of phosphoric acid. By dividing the number of moles of lithium hydroxide that we've just calculated by 3, we can find the number of moles of phosphoric acid that was in the burette. This value is 0 0.0083 moles of phosphoric acid. Now that we have two pieces of information about the phosphoric acid, we can find the concentration by dividing the moles by the average titer volume, 0 0.47 moles per litre. Neutralisation reactions can be used to make soluble salts. If you wish to make your salt using an acid and an alkali, you can first carry out a titration to find the required volumes of acid and alkali, and then repeat the titration without indicator to make the salt solution. This can then be heated to evaporation to produce a dry salt. You can also produce soluble salts using insoluble bases. You can add excess base to the acid until the reaction is complete, then filter off the excess base to get your salt solution and then evaporate to dryness to produce your salt. Thank you for watching my video, I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and ring the bell so you can be notified of new videos. You can also follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Chem and Instagram Miss Adams Chemistry for updates on new videos and flashcards throughout the year. Bye for now!